Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Tom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we get on with the rest of the show, I'd like to ask you for a little support. I've mentioned before that I've recently gone uh, self-employed to spend a little bit more time with my family and a little bit less time surrounded by hundreds and thousands of people. So now's a good time if you're so inclined and if you can and are able to, to give a little bit of support to myself and to Sleepy Time Tales. Things are not desperate. I've got money to keep me going for a while. But it is a good time now to... um sign up to the Patreon or use the sleep phone referral link and don't forget to use your discount code sleepy time if you do that well that's in the show notes I've put up some new stuff on the merch store on Public, some more fun sort of designs or there's of course the tip jar on the website so any way you can help out if there's a way you can and you're able and you're willing that uh, would be very much appreciated on the subject of supporters, I'd like to shout out Laurie for signing up for the Patreon recently. Thanks very much to you for signing up. As to Mary more well-rested nights, and thanks Laurie for helping me to keep this going, and for the kind words. And of course another huge way to help the show is simply to spread the word. If you know someone who is struggling to sleep, just telling them about Sleepy Time Tales will help them and help me to reach somebody new. And after all, that is what really matters. I'm also moving full-time into the podcast editing business, which is what I'm going to be doing as I'm working from home. So if you or someone you know wants to start a podcast or is doing one and is finding the whole editing and technical side a little bit too much to handle, too boring or too time-consuming, I'm the person for that. Just give me a shout. And they can give me a line at dave at brightfoxaudio.com. I also, of course, need to give a shout out to the music, which I think I've missed for a couple of weeks now. So thanks to um, Kumiko for Sweet Night and Friends. Let's get back to the show. Thanks for listening. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? What is this strange idea, this strange thing, this podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? But lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century, and this is a podcast intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night, or sometimes background noise or simply just company. That's why I make these episodes a little long, so that I'm here for you, without any pressure of the end coming. As far as I know, there are a couple of different ways to engage with the show. The primary idea is that it gives you something to focus on, a story or an event that lets you keep your mind on a specific point to stop it from spinning out into stress and anxieties, to help you to focus just enough not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep when it comes for you. It's important as you listen though that you don't try to force the sleep. Just keep a light mental grip on the thread of the story and allow the need for sleep to come for you. Now I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but don't feel pressurized. It may not work on the first night. Maybe it will take a few nights for you to get used to listening to my voice. Maybe my accent is strange to you. Maybe one episode just isn't long enough. Or maybe your problem isn't going to sleep. Maybe you find yourself waking up in the middle of the night. 
what I recommend because what's what works for me is to let the podcast run all night. In your podcast player of choice, download a whole bunch of episodes, put them in a playlist, and then when you go to bed, start them up and let them go. So that way, if you wake up at 3 a.m. and it's still running, you can just pop your earbuds back in and just allow yourself to go straight back to sleep again. You can even do the same sort of thing if you uh, wake up before your alarm. 60 minutes or as little as 30 minutes. Go back to sleep again for a little while and some people might actually think it's a little bit strange. What's the point, after all, of just an extra 30 minutes of sleep? But I've had people actually write in and thank me for the suggestion. Because there is something about allowing yourself complete relaxation right before the alarm that's satisfying on a whole new level. It's important though that you try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this will probably seem strange to you. So give it a chance. Because I'm here to work with you. To create a safe space. A cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course you aren't hearing me. Except maybe in a dream. We're returned tonight to Lady Audley's Secret by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter 6 Anywhere, anywhere out of the world. When they returned to Lansdowne Cottage, they found the old man had not yet come in. So they walked down to the beach to look for him. After a brief search, they found him sitting upon a heap of pebbles reading a newspaper and eating full bits. The little boy was at some distance from his grandfather, digging in the sand with a wooden spade. The crepe round the old man's shabby hat, and the child's poor little black frock, went to George's heart. Go where he would, he met fresh confirmation of this great grief of life. His wife was dead. Mr. Malden, he said, as he approached his father-in-law. The old man looked up, and dropping his newspaper, rose from the pebbles with a ceremonious brow. His faded light hair was tinged with grey. He had a pinched hooked nose, watery blue eyes, and an irresolute-looking mouth. He wore his shabby dress with an affectation of foppish gentility. An hourglass dangled over his closely buttoned-up waistcoat, and he carried a cane in his ungloved hand. Red heaven, cried George, don't you know me? Mr. Molden started and coloured violently, with something of a frightened look as he recognised his son-in-law. My dear boy, he said, I did not. For the first moment I did not. That beard makes such a difference. You find the beard makes a great difference, do you not, sir? He said, appealing to Robert. Great heavens, exclaimed George Tallboys. Is this the way you welcome me? I come to England to find my wife dead within a week of my touching land. And you begin to chatter to me about my beard. You, my father. True, true. True, muttered the old man, wiping his bloodshot eyes. A sad shock, a sad shock, my dear George. If you'd only been here a week earlier. If I had, cried George, in an outburst of grief and passion, I scarcely think that I would have let her die. I would have disputed for her with death. I would, I would. But God, why did not the Argus go down with every soul on board her before I came to see this day? He began to walk up and down the beach, his father-in-law looking helplessly at him, rubbing his feeble eyes with a handkerchief. I have a strong notion that the old man didn't treat his daughter too well, thought Robert, as he watched the half-pay lieutenant. He seems for some reason or other to be half-afraid of George. 
while the agitated young man walked up and down in a fever of regret and despair. The child ran to his grandfather and clung about the tails of his coat. Come home, Grandpa, come home, he said, I'm tired. George Talboys turned at the sound of the babyish voice and looked long and earnestly at the boy. He had his father's brown eyes and dark hair. My darling, my darling, said George, taking the child in his arms. I'm your father. I've come across the sea to find you. Will you love me? The little fellow pushed him away. I don't know you, he said. I love Grandpa and Mrs. Monks at Southampton. Georgie has a temper of his own, sir, said the old man. He has been spoiled. They walked slowly back to the cottage, and once more George Tolboys told the history of the desertion which had seemed so cruel. He told two of the twenty thousand pounds banked by him the day before. He had not the heart to ask any questions about the past, and his father-in-law only told him that a few months after his departure, they had gone from the place where George left them to live at Southampton where Helen got a few pupils for the piano, and where they managed pretty well until her health failed, and she fell into the decline of which she died. Like most sad stories, it was a very brief one. The boy seems fond of you, Mr. Mulden, said George, after a pause. Yes, yes, answered the old man, smoothing the child's curling hair. Yes, Georgie is very fond of his grandfather. Then he had better stop with you. The interest of my money will be about six hundred a year. You can draw a hundred of that for Georgie's education, leaving the rest to accumulate till he is of age. My friend here will be trustee, and if he will undertake the charge, I will appoint him guardian to the boy, allowing him for the present to remain under your care. But why not take care of him yourself, George? asked Robert Audley because I shall sail in the very next vessel that leaves Liverpool for Australia. I shall be better in the diggings or the backwoods than ever I could be here. I'm broken for a civilised life from this hour, Bob. The old man's weak eyes sparkled as George declared his determination. My poor boy, I think you're right, he said. I really think you're right. The change, the wild life, the, the... He hesitated and broke down as Robert looked earnestly at him. You're in a great hurry to get rid of your son-in-law, I think, Mr. Malden, he said gravely. Get rid of him, dear boy? Oh, no, no, but... But for his own sake, my dear sir, for his own sake, you know... I think for his own sake he'd much better stay in England and look after his son, said Robert. But I tell you I can't, cried George. Every inch of this accursed ground is hateful to me. I want to run out of it as I would out of a graveyard. I'll go back to town tonight, get that business about the money settled early tomorrow morning and start for Liverpool without a moment's delay. I shall be better when I've put half the world between me and her grave. Before he left the house, he stole out to the landlady and asked some more questions about his dead wife. Were they poor, he asked. Were they pinched for money while she was ill? Oh no, the woman answered. Though the captain dresses shabby, he has always plenty of sovereigns in his purse. The poor lady wants it for nothing. George was relieved at this, although it puzzled him to know whether a drunken half-pay lieutenant could have contrived to find money for all the expenses of his daughter's illness. But he was too thoroughly broken down by the calamity which had befallen him to be able to think much of anything. So he asked no further questions, but walked with his father-in-law and Robert Audley down to the boat by which they were to cross to Portsmouth. 
The old man bade Robert to very ceremonious adieu. You did not introduce me to your friend by the bar, my dear boy, he said. George stared at him, muttered something indistinct, and ran down the ladder to the boat before Mr. Molden could repeat his request. The steamer sped away through the sunset, and the outline of the island melted in the horizon as they neared the opposite shore. To think, said George, that two nights ago, at this time, I was steaming into Liverpool, full of the hope of clasping her to my heart, and tonight I'm going away from her grave. The document which appointed Robert Audley as guardian to little George Talboys was drawn up in the solicitor's office the next morning. It's a great responsibility, exclaimed Robert. I, guardian to anybody or anything. I, who never in my life could take care of myself. I trust in your noble heart, Bob, said George. I know you will take care of my poor orphan boy and see that it is well used by his grandfather. I shall only draw enough from Georgie's fortune to take me back to Sydney and then begin my old work again. But it seemed as if George was destined to be himself the guardian of his son. For when he reached Liverpool he found that a vessel had just sailed and that there would not be another for a month. So he returned to London and once more threw himself upon Robert Audley's hospitality. The barrister received him with open arms. He gave him the room with the birds and flowers, and had a bed put up in his dressing room for himself. Grief is so selfish that George did not know the sacrifices his friend made for his comfort. He only knew that for him the sun was darkened, and the business of life done. He sat all day long smoking cigars and staring at the flowers and canaries, chafing for the time to pass that he might be far out at sea. But just as the hour was drawing near for the sailing of the vessel, Robert Audley came in one day, full of a great scheme. A friend of his, another of those barristers whose last thought was of a brief, was going to St. Petersburg to spend the winter, and wanted Robert to accompany him. Robert would only go on condition that George went too. For a long time the young man resisted, but when he found out that Robert was, in a quiet way, thoroughly determined upon not going without him, he gave in, and consented to join the party. What did it matter, he said. One place was the same to him as another. Anywhere out of England. What did he care where? This was not a very cheerful way of looking at things. But Robert Audley was quite satisfied with having won his consent. The three young men started under very favourable circumstances carrying letters of introduction to the most influential inhabitants of the Russian capital. Before leaving England, Robert wrote to his cousin Alicia, telling her of his intended departure with his old friend, George Talboys, whom he had lately met for the first time after a lapse of years, and who had just lost his wife. Alicia's reply came by return post and ran thus, My dear Robert, how cruel of you to run away to that horrid St. Petersburg before the hunting season. I have heard that people lose their noses in that disagreeable climate, and as yours is rather a long one, I should advise you to return before the very severe weather sets in. What sort of person is this, Mr. Tomboys? If he is very agreeable, you may bring him to the court as soon as you return from your travels. Lady Audley tells me to request you to secure her a set of sables. You are not to consider the price, but to be sure that they are the handsomest that can be obtained. Papa is perfectly absurd about his new wife, and she and I cannot get on together at all. 
Not that she is disagreeable to me, for as far as that goes, she makes herself agreeable to everyone. But she is so irretrievably childish and silly. Believe me to be, my dear Robert, your affectionate cousin, Alicia Audley. Chapter 7 After a Year The first year of George Talboy's widowhood passed away. A deep band of crepe about his hat grew brown and dusty, and as the last burning day of another August faded out, he sat smoking cigars in the quiet chambers of Fig Tree Court, much as he had done the year before, when the horror of his grief was new to him, and every object in life, however trifling or however important, seemed saturated with his one great sorrow. But the big extra goon had survived his affliction by twelve months, and hard as it may be to have to tell it, he did not look much the worse for it. Heaven knows what wasted agonies of remorse and self-reproach may not have racked George's honest heart as he lay awake at nights, thinking of the wife he had abandoned in the pursuit of a fortune which she never lived to share. Once, while they were abroad, Robert Audley ventured to congratulate him upon his recovered spirits. He burst into a bitter laugh. Do you know, Bob, he said, that when some of our fellows were wounded in India, they came home, bringing bullets inside them. They did not talk of them, and they were stout and hearty, and looked as well, perhaps, as you or I. But every change in the weather, however slight, every variation of the atmosphere, however trifling, brought back the old agony of their wounds as sharp as ever they had felt it on the battlefield. I've had my wound, Bob. I carry the bullet still, and I shall carry it into my coffin. The travellers returned from St. Petersburg in the spring, and George again took up his quarters at his old friend's chambers, only leaving them now and then to run down to Southampton and take a look at his little boy. He always went loaded with toys and sweetmeats to give to the child. But for all this, Georgie would not become very familiar with his papa. And the young man's heart sickened as he began to fancy that even his child was lost to him. What can I do, he thought. If I take him away from his grandfather, I shall break his heart. If I let him remain, he will grow up a stranger to me and care more for that drunken old hypocrite than for his own father. But then what could an ignorant, heavy dragoon like me do with such a child? What could I teach him except to smoke cigars and idle around all day with his hands in his pockets? So the anniversary of that 30th of August, upon which George had seen the advertisement of his wife's death in the Times newspaper, came around for the first time. And the young man put off his black clothes and the shabby crepe from his hat and laid his mournful garments in a trunk in which he kept a packet of his wife's letters, her portrait, and that lock of hair which had been cut from her head after death. Robert Audley had never seen either the letters, the portrait, or the long tress of silky hair. Nor indeed had George ever mentioned the name of his dead wife after that one day in Ventnor, on which he learned the full particulars of her decease. I shall write to my cousin Alicia today, George, said the young barrister, upon this very 30th of August. Do you know that the day after tomorrow is the 1st of September? I shall write and tell her that we will both run down to the court for a week's shooting. No, no, Bob, go by yourself. They don't want me, and I'd rather bury yourself in Fig Tree Court, with no company but my dogs and canaries. No, George, you shall do nothing of the kind. But I don't care for shooting. And do you suppose I care for it? cried Robert, with charming naivete. Why, man, I don't know a partridge from a pigeon. And it might be the 1st of April instead of the 1st of September, for aught I care. I never hurt a bird in my life, 
but I have hurt my own shoulder with the weight of my gun. I only go down to Essex for the change of air, the good dinners, and the sight of my uncle's honest, handsome face. Besides, this time I have another inducement. I want to go to see this fair-haired paragon, my new aunt. You'll go with me, George? Yes, if you really wish it. The quiet form his grief had taken after its first brief violence left him as submissive as a child to the will of his friend, ready to go anywhere or do anything, never enjoying himself or originating any enjoyment, but joining in the pleasures of others with a hopeless, uncomplaining, unobtrusive resignation, peculiar to a simple nature. But the return of post brought a letter from Alicia Audley, to say that the two young men could not be received at the court. There are seventeen spare bedrooms, wrote the young lady in an indignant running hand. But for all that, my dear Robert, you can't come. For my lady has taken it into her silly head that she is too ill to entertain visitors. There is no more the matter with her than there is with me and she cannot have gentlemen, great rough men, she says, in the house. Please apologise to your friend, Mr. Talboys, and tell him that Papa expects to see you both in the hunting season. My lady's airs and graces shan't keep us out of Essex for all that, said Robert, as he twisted the letter into a pop lot for his big meerschaum. I'll tell you what we'll do, George. There's a glorious inn at Audley, and plenty of fishing in the neighbourhood. We'll go there and have a week's sport. Fishing is much better than shooting, and you've only to lie on the bank and stare at your line. I don't find that you often catch anything, but it's very pleasant. He held the twisted letter to the feeble spark of fire glimmering in the grate as he spoke, and then changing his mind, deliberately unfolded it and smoothed the crumpled paper with his hand. Well, little Alicia, he said thoughtfully, it's rather hard to treat a letter so cavalierly. I'll keep it. Upon which Mr. Roberts Audley put the note back into its envelope. And afterward, thrust it into a pigeonhole in his office desk, marked Important. Heaven knows what wonderful documents there were in this particular pigeonhole, but I do not think it likely to have contained anything of great judicial value. If anyone could at that moment have told the young barrister that so simple a thing as his cousin's brief letter would one day come to be a link in that terrible chain of evidence afterward to be slowly forged in the only criminal case in which he was ever to be concerned, Perhaps Mr. Roberts Audley would have lifted his eyebrows a little higher than usual. So the two young men left London the next day, with one portmanteau and a rod and tackle between them, and reached the straggling, old-fashioned, fast-decaying village of Audley, in time to order a good dinner at the Sun Inn. Audley Court was about three-quarters of a mile from the village, lying, as I have said, deep down in the hollow, shut in by luxuriant timber. You could only reach it by a crossroad bordered by trees, and as trimly kept as the avenues in a gentleman's park. It was a lonely place enough, even in all its rustic beauty, for so bright a creature as the late Miss Lucy Graham but the generous baronet had transformed the interior of the grey old mansion into a little palace for his young wife, and Lady Audley seemed as happy as a child, surrounded by new and costly toys. In her better fortunes, as in her old days of dependence, wherever she went, she seemed to take sunshine and gladness with her. In spite of Miss Alicia's undisguised contempt for her stepmother's childishness and frivolity, Lucy was better loved and more admired than the baronet's daughter. That very childishness had a charm which few could resist.
The innocence and candor of an infant beamed in Lady Audley's fair face and shone out of her large and liquid blue eyes. The rosy lips, the delicate nose, the profusion of fair ringlets, all contributed to preserve to her beauty the character of extreme youth and freshness. She owed to twenty years of age, but it was hard to believe her more than seventeen. Her fragile figure, which she loved to dress in heavy velvets and stiff rustling silks, till she looked like a child tricked out for a masquerade, was as girlish as if she had just left the nursery. All her amusements were childish. She hated reading, or study of any kind, and loved society. Rather than be alone, she would admit Phoebe Marks into her confidence, and loll on one of the sofas in her luxurious dressing room, discussing a new costume for some coming dinner party, or sit chattering to the girl with her jewel box beside her, upon the satin cushions, and Sir Markle's presence spread out in her lap, while she counted and admired her treasures. She had appeared at several public halls at Chelmsford and Colchester, and was immediately established as the belle of the county. Pleased with her high position and her handsome house, with every caprice gratified, every whim indulged, admired and caressed wherever she went, fond of a generous husband, rich in a noble allowance of pin money, with no poor relations to worry her with claims upon her purse or patronage, it would have been hard to find in the county of Essex a more fortunate creature than Lucy, Lady Audley. The two young men loitered over the dinner table in the private sitting room at the Sun Inn. The windows were thrown wide open, and the fresh country air blew in upon them as they dined. The weather was lovely, the foliage of the woods touched here and there with faint gleams of the earliest tints of autumn the yellow corn still standing in some of the fields, and others just falling under the shining sickle, while in the narrow lanes you met great wagons drawn by broad-chested cart-horses, carrying home the rich golden store. To anyone who has been during the hot summer months pent up in London, there is in the first taste of rustic life a kind of sensuous rapture, scarcely to be described. George Talboys felt this, and in this he experienced the nearest approach to enjoyment that he had ever known since his wife's death. The clock struck five as they finished dinner. Put on your hat, George, said Robert Audley. They don't dine at the court till seven. We shall have time to stroll down and see the old place and its inhabitants. The landlord, who had come into the room with a bottle of wine, looked up as the young man spoke. I beg your pardon, Mr. Audley, he said, but if you want to see your uncle, you'll lose your time by going to the court just now. Sir Markle and my lady and Miss Alicia have all gone to the races at Chorley, and they won't be back till nigh upon eight o'clock, most likely. They must pass by here to go home. Under these circumstances, of course, it was no use going to the court. So the two young men strolled to the village and looked at the old church, and then went and reconnoitred the streams in which they were to fish the next day, and by such means beguiled the time till after seven o'clock. At about a quarter past that hour they returned to the inn, and setting themselves in the open window, lit their cigars and looked out at the peaceful prospect. It was dusk, when gigs and chases, dog carts and clumsy farmers' phaetons began to rattle through the village street, and under the windows of the Sun Inn. Deeper dusk still when an open carriage and four drew suddenly up beneath the rocking signpost. It was Sir Michael Audley's barouche which came to so sudden a stop before the little inn. The harness of one of the leaders had become out of order, 
and the foremost postillion dismounted to set it right. Why, it's my uncle, cried Robert Audley, as the carriage stopped. I'll run down and speak to him. George lit another cigar and, sheltered by the window curtains, looked out at the little party. Alicia sat with her back to the horses, and he could perceive, even in the dusk, that she was a handsome brunette. But Lady Audley was seated on the side of the carriage furthest from the inn, and he could see nothing of the fair-haired paragon of whom he had heard so much. Why, Robert, exclaimed Sir Michael, as his nephew emerged from the inn, this is a surprise. I have not come to intrude upon you at the court, my dear uncle, said the young man, as the baronet shook him by the hand in his own hearty fashion. Essex is my native county, you know, and about this time of year I generally have a touch of homesickness. So George and I have come down to the inn for two or three days fishing. George? George who? George Tellboys. What? He has come, cried Alicia. I'm so glad. I'm dying to see this handsome young widower. Are you Alicia? said her cousin. Then he gad, I'll run and fetch him and introduce you to him at once. Now so complete was the dominion which Lady Audley had, in her own childish unthinking way, obtained over her devoted husband, and it was very rarely that the baronet's eyes were long removed from his wife's pretty face. When Robert therefore was about to re-enter the inn, it needed but the faintest elevation of Lucy's eyebrows, with a charming expression of weariness and terror, to make her husband aware that she did not want to be bored by an introduction to Mr. George Tolboys. Never mind tonight, Bob, he said. My wife is a little tired after our long day's pleasure. Bring your friend to dinner tomorrow, and then he and Alicia can make each other's acquaintance. Come round and speak to Lady Audley, and then we'll drive home. My lady was so terribly fatigued that she could only smile sweetly and hold out a tiny gloved hand to her nephew by marriage. You will come and dine with us tomorrow and bring your interesting friend, she said, in a low and tired voice. She had been the chief attraction of the race course and was wearied out by exertion of fascinating half the country. It's a wonder she didn't treat you to her never-ending laugh, whispered Alicia as she leaned over the carriage door to bid Robert good night. But I dare say she reserves that for your delectation tomorrow. I suppose you are fascinated as everybody else, added the young lady rather snappishly. She's a lovely creature, certainly, murmured Robert with placid admiration. Oh, of course. Now she's the first woman of whom I have ever heard you say a civil word, Robert Audley. I'm sorry to find you can only admire wax dolls. For Alicia had had many skirmishes with her cousin upon that particular temperament of his, which, while it enabled him to go through life with perfect contentment and tacit enjoyment, entirely precluded his feeling one spark of enthusiasm upon any subject whatever. As to his ever falling in love, thought the young lady sometimes, the idea is preposterous. If all the divinities on earth were ranged before him waiting for his sultanship to throw the handkerchief, he would only lift his eyebrows to the middle of his forehead and tell them to scramble for it. But for once in his life Robert was almost enthusiastic. She's the prettiest little creature you ever saw in your life, George, he cried when the carriage had driven off and he returned to his friend. Such blue eyes, such ringlets, such a ravishing smile, and such a fairy-like bonnet, all of a tremble with heartsease and dewy spangles, shining out of a cloud of gauze. George tell boys I feel like the hero of a French novel. I'm falling in love with my aunt. 
The widow only sighed and puffed his cigar fiercely out of the open window. Perhaps he was thinking of that faraway time. Little better than five years ago, in fact. But such an age gone by to him when he first met the woman for whom he had worn crepe around his hat three days before. They returned. All these old unforgotten feelings. They came back with the scene of their birthplace. Again he lounged with his brother officers upon the shabby pier at the shabby watering place, listening to a dreary band with a cornet that was a note and a half flat. Kane heard the old operatic airs and again she came tripping toward him, leaning on her old father's arm and pretending with such a charming, delicious, seriocomic pretense, to be listening to the music, and quite unaware of the admiration of half a dozen open-mouthed cavalry officers. Again the old fancy came back, that she was, she was something too beautiful for earth, or earthly uses, and that to approach her was to walk in a higher atmosphere, and to breathe a purer air. And since this she had been his wife, and the mother of his child. She lay in the little churchyard at Ventnor, and only a year ago he had given the order for her tombstone. A few slow, silent tears dropped upon his waistcoat as he thought of these things in the quiet and darkening room. Lady Audley was so exhausted when she reached home that she excused herself from the dinner table and retired at once to her dressing room, attended by her maid, Phoebe Marks. She was a little capricious in her conduct to this maid, sometimes very confidential, sometimes rather reserved. But she was a liberal mistress, and the girl had every reason to be satisfied with her situation. This evening, in spite of her fatigue, she was in extremely high spirits and gave an animated account of the races and the company present at them. I'm tired to death though, Phoebe, she said by and by. I'm afraid I must look a perfect fright after a day in the hot sun. There were lighted candles on each side of the glass before which Lady Audley was standing, unfastening her dress. She looked full at her maid as she spoke, her blue eyes clear and bright, and the rosy childish lips puckered into an arch smile. You are a little pale, my lady, answered the girl, but you look as pretty as ever. That's right, Phoebe, she said, flinging herself into a chair, and throwing back her curls at the maid, who stood brush in hand, ready to arrange the luxuriant hair for the night. Do you know, Phoebe, I have heard some people say that you and I are alike. I've heard them say so too, my lady, said the girl quietly. But they must be very stupid to say it. For your ladyship is a beauty, and I am a poor plain creature. Not at all, Phoebe, said the little lady superbly. You are like me, and your features are very nice. And there's only colour that you want. My hair is pale yellow shot with gold and yours is drab. My eyebrows and eyelashes are dark brown and yours are almost... I scarcely like to say it, but they're almost white, dear Phoebe. Your complexion is sallow and mine is pink and rosy. While with a bottle of hair dye, such as we see advertised in the papers, and a pot of rouge, you'd be as good looking as I any day, Phoebe. She prattled on in this way for a long time, talking of a hundred different subjects, and ridiculing the people she had met at the races for her maid's amusement. Her stepdaughter came into the dressing room to bid her good night, and found the maid and mistress laughing aloud over one of the day's adventures. Alicia, who was never familiar with her servants, withdrew in disgust at my lady's frivolity. Go on brushing my hair, Phoebe, Lady Audley said, every time the girl was about to complete her task. I quite enjoy a chat with you. 
At last, just as she had dismissed her maid, she suddenly called her back. Phoebe Marks, she said, I want you to do me a favour. Yes, my lady? I want you to go to London by the first train tomorrow morning to execute a little commission for me. You may take a day's holiday afterward, as I know you have friends in town. I shall give you a five-pound note if you do what I want, and keep your own counsel about it. Yes, my lady. See that the door is securely shut, and come and sit on the stool at my feet. The girl obeyed. Lady Audley smoothed her maid's neutral-tinted hair with her plump, white and bejeweled hand as she reflected for a few moments. And now listen, Phoebe, what I want you to do is very simple. It was so simple that it was told in five minutes, and then Lady Audley retired into her bedroom and curled herself up cosily under her eiderdown quilt. She was a chilly creature and loved to bury herself in soft wrappings of satin and fur. Kiss me, Phoebe, she said as the girl arranged the curtains. I hear Sir Michael step in the anteroom. You will meet him as you go out, and you may as well tell him that you are going up by the first train tomorrow morning to get my dress from Madame Frederick for the dinner at Morton Abbey. It was late the next morning when Lady Audley went down for breakfast, past ten o'clock. While she was sipping her coffee, her servant brought her a sealed packet and a book for her to sign. A telegraphic message, she cried, for the convenient word telegram had not yet been invented. What can be the matter? She looked up at her husband with wide-open, terrified eyes. and seemed half afraid to break the seal. The envelope was addressed to Miss Lucy Graham, at Mr. Dawson's, and had been sent on from the village. Read it, my darling, he said, and do not be alarmed. It may be nothing of any importance. It came from a Mrs. Vincent, the schoolmistress with whom she had lived before entering Mr. Dawson's family. The lady was dangerously ill and implored her old pupil to go and see her. Poor soul, she was meant to leave me her money, said Lucy, with a mournful smile. She has never heard of the change in my fortunes. Yes, Sir Michael, I must go to her. To be sure you must, dearest. If she was kind to my poor girl in her adversity, she has a claim upon her prosperity that shall never be forgotten. Put on your bonnet, Lucy. We shall be in time to catch the express. You will go with me? Of course, my darling. Do you suppose I would let you go alone? I was sure you would go with me, she said thoughtfully. Does your friend send any address? No, but she always lived at Crescent Villa, West Brompton. And no doubt she lives there still. It was only time for Lady Audley to hurry on her bonnet and shawl before she heard the carriage drive down to the door, and Sir Michael calling to her at the foot of the staircase. Her suite of rooms, as I have said, opened one out of another, and terminated in an octagon antechamber hung with oil paintings. Even in her haste she paused deliberately at the door of this room, double-locked it, and dropped the key into her pocket. The door once locked cut off all access to my lady's apartments. And I think we're going to call it there. As always, if you'd like to pick up where we've left off and find out what duplicitous Miss Lucy is up to, you can find the original on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. Make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiku. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. 
Good night and sweet dreams.